It is my privilege to be here tonight. It's actually a special privilege for me because I'm a daughter of Roseland. Um, and so being here on the far south side where I grew up, um, in the current South Sider in Hyde Park now, um, this particular conversation is actually relevant to me um, because I am a South Side person. I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. I know that initially we were doing this as a virtual event, but what we quickly realized was that some of the most powerful work that happens at events like this is when people from community can work with one another, share ideas and thoughts and insights. And so we'll, this is one of six events. Um, there will be, there are several others which I will talk about. Um, I want to thank, in addition to all of you for being here, I want to thank my team who put this together uh, with a lot of hard work and fast work. I want to thank the Community Safety Coordination Center, CSCC, who's also helped so much, not just in putting this together, but in putting together the plan um, to help make our city safe. I want to thank AIS, who I always forget to thank. Um, we would have no audio visual if it were not for AIS. Um, and I want to do a, 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 a uh, 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 another thanks, and that's to the, the police officers who are here. I notice a lot of young police officers walking in. Um, one of the things that we hope um, can come out of this event is an opportunity for community to see CPD um, in a more human and personal way by sitting together and working together on these questions. Um, my final thanks, and it's probably the biggest thanks, goes to Chicago State University. Um, Chicago State it was so gracious to allow us to use this space. Um, uh, President Z. Scott is here with us. Her team is just absolutely amazing. And so I want to do a for Chicago State. <laughs> And now it's my privilege to introduce to you the president of Chicago State University, President Z. Scott. Good evening, everyone. I didn't hear you. I am president of Chicago State, and thank you, Tina, for that warm introduction. And I am delighted to welcome you to the campus of Chicago State U University for tonight's meeting. I want to thank Mayor Lightfoot and the City of Chicago for their leadership and work on this event. And Chicago State is delighted to welcome each of you to our campus for this critically important conversation. I am a South Sider. I am a Southeast Sider. I grew up in the Jeffrey Manor neighborhood, just east of here. I graduated from Bowen High School. I have never left the south side of Chicago. And I have never given up on the south side of Chicago. So that is even more important why this, con this e even more reason why this conversation is personal to me and important to me. But as you speak to tonight's issues and you convene and you talk with one another, remember that there is one important thing that can help and could be a solution to the violence in our communities. And that is access to a good education. The work that we do at Chicago State is driven by a mission to increase opportunities for our students and our communities to higher education. We are Illinois' only four-year U.S. Department of Education predominantly black institution. We offer our freshmen free tuition, free. No books, you, pay, you don't pay for books, you don't pay for your computer, you don't pay for fees, and you don't pay for your tuition. It is all free. Spread that in our community. So on your way to, after the conversation, please stop by and talk to our recruiters who are upstairs. Because people make decisions about education, not based on what I tell them, but they make it based on what they hear in the community, what they hear from their church, what they hear from their aunties, what they hear from their mothers and cousins. So you are the decision maker for many of the students out there thinking about going to college. I look forward to tonight's conversation 
and I thank you for being here at Chicago State University. Thank you. Thank you, President Scott. Um, I've had such a privilege of working with Chicago State and President Scott um, since I've taken on the role um, in the mayor's office. And so I actually count her not just as an amazing woman in the community, but as a friend. Um, and so I'm really delighted to be here. Um, we have some other special guests um, in the room. Uh, the, <laughs> there are many, many commissioners from the city many, many deputy commissioners from the city. I'm gonna miss some because people have been coming in, but um, you can expect to hear from Dr. Arwady, Commissioner Kanazi, um, from DFSS, uh, D cases represented, Chicago Department of Transportation, I think Commissioner Biagi may be here, uh, uh, Cole Stoller, who's Streets and Sanitation, um, we'll expect the C CPS CEO to come um, Ivan Capital, who is a deputy commissioner at BACP, the Bureau of um, Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. Our goal was to make sure you had access um, to these people who basically run the government and, and serve you in the government. We also have some aldermen here, and I have not been able to keep up with all my texts. I know that Alderman O'Shea is here. Could you stand up if you're here? Yay! So, um, you may be our only alderman. Lucky you. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. All the aldermen from the South Side were invited. Today is City Council Day. I don't know how you're awake, because uh, I know it was a really long meeting today. Um, but know that we are eager to work with the aldermen all across the city. Um, they are our partners um, in making our city safe. Um, and we are delighted and grateful that they are here. Um, finally, I want to do a special acknowledgement to the faith leaders who are here. And again, I don't have my full list, so I'm not going to call out all of you because I know some, but not others. Um, I want to thank um, our chief um, for faith engagement, Vance Henry, for doing such a wonderful job in getting faith leaders here, particularly in the black community. Um, and don't let this face fool you. I'm, I'm from the black community. Um, it is critically important that faith be at the table in these discussions. As I mentioned, this is one of six town halls that we're doing. We did the West Side on Saturday. Um, there will be a youth-focused town hall uh, on next Saturday. Um, we'll also hit the other regions, Southwest Side, North Northwest Side, um, and then what we call City Center, which is the loop and all the near um, West Side, near uh, near South Side, near West Side, near North Side. There are three goals in all of these engagements. And the goal in all of these engagements is to make sure that we are informing you of what we have done or are going to do. It's also important for us to be your thought partner. It's one of the reasons I've been saying, please do your uh, survey. Um, you will also see that there is a sheet on the table. It looks like this. And there's only one sheet per table. The idea is that you all will be working together and helping us identify the five priorities or the five things that you think, if we prioritize, would make a difference in um, the, the stemming the violence that this is plaguing the city. And finally, and most importantly, I bet for you is we're going to do your questions and we're going to answer your questions. We do not, this is not going to be an open mic session. You were either given at registration or you will see on your table a form that looks like this. Please write down whatever question or comment you want either the mayor or somebody from our team to answer um, or you want to make sure the mayor or somebody on our team understands. These questions will be collected and then we sort them. The reason we do this question is not because we're afraid to answer hard questions. And you'll see when we enter the Q&A period that we will be asking the hard questions. The hard questions, the tough questions, are the ones that all of us know will get us to move forward in this process. But what we find is that when you can answer these questions, we start to see trends. 
look, we have a pile of questions this thick about a certain topic or other topics. Um, it gives us an idea of what the important issues are. And what is incredibly, what will happen with these questions and with this sheet is at the end of our engagements, once we finish all of these meetings, we're going to compile a report. And that report is going to capture all of your recommendations and it's going to analyze the questions and concerns that we've collected on these cards. So it's incredibly important that you both fill this out and that you do your questions. To the point of informing, there are a couple of things that we wanted to make sure we, the room was level set on. So I should have said this earlier, the meeting's being recorded um, uh, and that recording will also be available to everyone. Um, if you have any questions after this, community engagement at cityofchicago.org comes to my team and we are a very small team so we actually see those questions. So feel free to send us notes. If we flip to the next slide, there are resources, investments, and funding. Some of you were able to go to the resource fair. On your table, there is this document. It's a list of resources that are available for all of you. We want you to use them. And importantly, when we were on the west side, we realized that we started having the conversation and people didn't understand the types of investments that had already been made. And so I want to be sure as we start this session, we do have that understanding. We finished the 2022 budget in October of last year. Um, we are in the process now of actually implementing that budget. But the drivers of that budget were, we wanted to build a thriving and safe community, we wanted an equitable economic recovery, and we wanted to make sure essential government services were available on all parts of the city. We know that we can't get to any of these goals. We can't have a thriving community and we can't have an equitable recovery unless we confront and address the violence that, our, that is plaguing our city today. And that's why the mayor's top priority is public safety. If you flip to the next slide, these are the specific investments. And again, these sheets are on your table. There are multiple sheets. You can bring them home with you. You can study them. One of the things that we heard on the west side was that there wasn't enough investment in public safety, in, in the root causes of violence. Everybody in this room, including law enforcement, know that we are not going to law enforce our way out of this. We have got to address the root causes. And there were $1.9 billion in investments to address the root causes of violence. Youth programs, youth jobs, trauma recovery, mental health services, housing and security. If you look at this list, you will see the many, many investments, billions of dollars in investments that have been made in addressing those root causes of violence. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that you had that understanding as you um, considered some of the other parts of tonight's discussion. So with that, I want to introduce my friend and colleague, um, Tamara Mahal. Tamara operates and leads the uh, community, I'm always getting it wrong, CSCC, the Community Safety Coordinating Committee. Close? Okay. Center. She'll get it, center. Um, but I want you all to thank uh, and Tamara. I also like a couple of people came in, I also just want to acknowledge, I want to acknowledge Chief Novales, who is the chief for civil, for constitutional issues. He's just amazing, so stand up. Um, and there are bunches of other like people with like stars on them in front of me, um, but uh, we have some really top tier representation um, from the city. Thank you all. Hi everyone, thank you for being here tonight. My name is Tamara Mahal and I am the Mayor's Chief Coordination Officer for Community Safety. Um, I actually want to start not by talking about violence, but talking about COVID for one second, because the COVID-19 pandemic was a pivotal moment for the city government and Mayor Lightfoot's administration that really encouraged and forced us to really think about the best way for government to work in service of community. 
The interesting thing about violence is that the root causes of violence that we see that are so persistent in our communities across the West and the South Side are very much the same root causes that led to the health disparities that we saw in the COVID-19 pandemic. And through a lot of listening and engagement, through forming special steering committees like the Racial Equity Rapid Response Team, we came to understand that government is at its best when we are coordinating behind the scenes in order to rapidly address the needs as identified by community. And so with that, last summer, the mayor said, we need to take what ultimately led to a successful response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the most equitable vaccine distribution in the United States, and we need to apply that to what is ultimately the city's largest epidemic, gun violence. And with that, she activated something called the Community Safety Coordination Center, which I have the privilege to lead. Let me just start by saying, first and foremost, the Community Safety Coordination Center's role is to bring together the public safety, the infrastructure, and the human services departments and agencies that work across the city of Chicago to implement a, compre a comprehensive, data-driven, evidence-based approach to violence reduction. This means that we are working across our departments to coordinate policy and systemic reforms that need to occur to address community revitalization and make sure that we not only have sustainable long-term investments in our infrastructure and our education, that we're also addressing short-term and immediate needs like vacant lot cleaning and, and, and street level issues, but that we're also putting together comprehensive programming that addresses and supports those who are at highest risk of violence, ensuring that even if they come into contact with law enforcement or justice, they also have access to mental health, substance use disorder treatment, housing, and opportunities in education and employment. We're coordinating all of that at the hyper-local level. Now that's something, we'll be honest, government likes to say, but what does that actually mean? It means we are here to serve a multi-layered engagement strategy that goes down to the block level. You're gonna hear a lot of talk tonight about block clubs and the need to work with community residents to identify the issues that are affecting their block, their neighborhood, their community, their, their region, so that we can get down to the root core and really address the needs that you're identifying. We also know that we need to put together some new strategies that address those root causes of violence. And so you're gonna hear more about this and we're happy to answer all of your questions tonight about the various things that we are doing, but we did wanna highlight that that means we're implementing, yes, a long-term mental health equity plan but also new trauma-informed response techniques um, to work directly with our street outreach and violence intervention workers. We're gonna increase green space and be out in your communities throughout the summer, um, maintaining and proactively addressing issues that are occurring on our blocks. We're investing in commercial corridors and creating new long-term employment opportunities. We, of course, are rolling out youth programming that addresses chronic absenteeism, but also out-of-school programming and youth summer employment opportunities. And we're really working to ensure, across our police department, the great work that they're leading to ensure that we can increase trust between police and community members. But one of the most vital roles we're also gonna play is just coordinating resources and support to ensure that there are referral pathways and more comprehensive support systems for the already great work that is going on in each of your communities, knowing that we are at our best when we're serving and coming to the existing tables, the existing collaboratives, listening and then responding to your needs. And with that context, we want to make sure that you know that there's an opportunity to provide us some feedback on some of the strategies we're currently looking at. On your table, there is a flyer. It has a QR code. There's also a website on it. It asks some pretty straightforward questions. What are the resources you'd like to see? You want to see cameras or do you want to see, do you want to see funding for doorbell cameras for your homes or would you rather see funding to support black level par uh, block party planning and green space additions? We're here to get your feedback, and while we're gonna be doing that, there are a lot of questions and answers. We would really love for you to complete the poll on your table 
My promise to you is you're going to see that turned into results here within the next couple of months. I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone tonight. With that, I will turn it back over to Tina. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to give a couple of minutes for those of you who have not done your QR code to do that real fast. So think of the Jeopardy tune. Do, 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 do. So it's really important information, and I promise you it's going to get used. So two minutes. Now I know that wasn't enough time, but you can multitask because I have a new project for you. The, the question cards. You've now seen the presentation. Um, some of you came in here with questions. So please complete your question cards and people from the mayor's office are going to walk around and collect them. I got to give you two minutes on that because I got to get you started on your exercise. But hold up your card like this and people from my team will be coming to get the cards. All right, everybody's got a sheet. There should be a sheet on every table. Please make sure you have the sheet on. There it is. It says 2022 Community Safety Town Hall Worksheet. The reason we gave you numbers when we came in and tried to divide you from your friends is so that you would be sitting at tables with people you might not know, but people who share the same commitments and concerns that you do. Working as a group. You don't have to put your names on here. Would love your neighborhoods, because that's how I know that all the neighborhoods have been represented. Working as a group on this sheet, you can use the back too. If you run out of paper, we'll give you some more. The five things, five things that you think the city should implement that will make a difference in public safety. So, Turn around, look at your neighbors, work as a group. Five things that will make a difference in making our city safe. I will tell you, as president of Chicago State, I was able to learn things more, more things about city resources that are available to people, to, to individuals in our community. And I intend to follow up with the city to bring some of those resources to our students here at Chicago State. So thank you, Mayor, for bringing the resources out and your team out to not only talk to our neighbors, but also talk to our community. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce the mayor of the city of Chicago to you tonight. And uh, let's welcome our mayor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will not uh, belabor you with a long speech. I think the most important thing uh, that we can do with the rest of the programming is really hear from you. But let me talk to you a little bit about why we are here. Um, somebody asked me, is this a stunt? Is this a stunt that the mayor is here on the south side um, and all the city commissioners are here, including uh, the folks that are up here on the table? And here's my answer. No, sir. When people in our city do not feel safe, when kids are growing up in environments where they know nothing but violence, when too many of our young people feel like their only choice in life is to tend somebody's corner spot, no sir, this is not a stunt. We have a responsibility and an obligation in this moment to do everything we can to make sure that our residents feel safe. And part of the reason that we are here on the south side, just as we were on the west side on Saturday, and we'll be going to other parts of the city for these in-person conversations, is we want you to hear from us and know the seriousness of purpose which we take every single day to work on ways in which we can keep our residents safe. We know that we're experiencing another one of those times where the escalation in gun violence and homicides and shootings is at a level that is unacceptable. We all know that. So what are we doing to make sure that we, that 2022 is a different story than 2021? Well, first we start with 
what we did last year. 2021 ended in a way that nobody was happy with. And so everyone on my team, from the superintendent, but also from the Department of Children and Family Services, Department of Public Health, and all of our agencies took a hard look at what worked, but importantly, what didn't. And we leaned into the things that we know are gonna make a difference. And we're focused on guns, gangs, and investments. And let me talk a, a little bit about each of those. Over 90% of the people who were homicide uh, victims last year died of gun violence. Last year, the Chicago Police Department took 12,000, 12,000 illegal guns off the street, breaking yet another record that was set the previous year. We took more guns off the streets than New York or LA combined. And think about that for a second. Two cities, both bigger in population than we are, but we took more illegal guns off the street than both of them combined. And that's true year in and year out. And it's not because we have a better uh, strategy, although I think we do. We're very focused on taking illegal guns off the street. The truth is we are awash in illegal guns. They pour over the border from Indiana and Wisconsin and Michigan, and there's been a consistent pipeline of illegal guns from southern states like Mississippi. So what we've done is increase the number of gun teams that are operating within the Chicago Police Department. We've leaned into our relationships with our federal partners, particularly uh, the ATF. And we have frankly challenged the Biden Department of Justice. And let me be clear, I'm a Democrat. I support the president and I want the president to be successful. But we need the Department of Justice to fully staff up our federal agencies here in our city, particularly the ATF, so that we can not just take guns off the streets in ones or twos, but we can get to the sources of the illegal guns. We sued gun shops in Indiana for making, because they're routinely selling to straw purchasers guns that end up on our streets in the hands of violent, dangerous criminals who are making your life and all of our lives less safe. We've added 100 detectives to our homicide um, uh, uh, resources to make sure that we're solving these crimes. And I'm happy to tell you that last year, we saw more homicides in the city of Chicago than in the past 19 years. And you can clap for that. And that is because, again, we hold people accountable. Every week when I have my meeting with CPD, one of the first questions I ask is, what is the homicide clearance rate? And those of you who followed this number know it was an embarrassing t it, number just five years ago. And now we're at 66%, close to what the national standard should be. But again, not good enough. And we've got to keep driving and making sure that we're doing everything possible. Same thing with, with gangs, right? We've got to hold these uh, people accountable. Look, I'm not saying we've got to lock everybody up and throw away the key. Mass incarceration doesn't work. We know that. We've been through that. 30 plus years of evidence that it doesn't work. But what we also know is there are some people who are simply dangerous. And what I know is that when you have the courage, and I'm going to borrow an expression from Father Mike, when you let your faith overcome your fears and you report a violent, dangerous person in your neighborhood, the last thing in the world you want to see after they're arrested is have them back on the street walking biggest day two or three days later after you thought that they had been taken off the street and held accountable for their crime. So we've got to keep making sure that we hold these violent, dangerous people accountable. But I also want to talk to you about this. It, those of you who have lived in the city for a long time, every decade, and sometimes multiple times a decade, we see a crime surge, and then we see the trough. We see a crime surge, and then we see a trough. Every single time previously, we've thrown massive amounts of police resources to bring down the crime wave. 
But have we ever brought permanent, lasting peace to neighborhoods that are plagued by violence? You know as well as I do, the answer is no. And so while we've got to continue to fight the fight regarding guns, we've got to fight the fight regarding violent, dangerous people, we cannot simply arrest our way out of this problem. What, what we can do and what will work is to invest our way out of this problem. We have to make sure that that young man in a neighborhood like Roseland, like Inglewood, like South Shore, and the list goes on and on, understands from the earliest possible stage that they have consciousness, that they have a future in this city, that they've got positive adults right there at their fingertips, even if it isn't in their household, that they've got teachers, they've got counselors, they've got somebody at the parks, at the libraries, who cares about them as an individual and is willing to wrap their arms around them with love and support. That is the way we permanently stem the violence that is plaguing way too many of these neighborhoods. We must invest in our young people at the earliest possible stage and their families to give them hope, to give them something that they can latch onto and see that there is a future for them in their city, in their neighborhood. Just today at McCormick Place, we have been sponsoring a workshop with trades in Chicago to see so our high school and junior high school kids, 3,000 of them are gonna pass through McCormick Place starting yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Not everybody's going to college, and that's okay, but we've gotta give them other options. And so we have bounded together with the trades to hold them accountable, but open up avenues of opportunity for our young people. Good jobs that within a few years after they finish their apprenticeship, they're gonna be making $50 an hour or more. That is the way that we invest in the future of our young people. So what I hope you have heard tonight and at your tables is that we have to be working together to solve these problems. If the issues of violence were simple, we would have solved them a long time ago. But you know as well as I do, what we're experiencing right now has been generations in the making. And we're only gonna get out of the problem that we are in right now by being diligent, by working on the guns, making sure that we're holding violent, dangerous people accountable, but fundamentally changing the calculus and seeing our young people and their families in an entirely different way. And using the resources that we are now so fortunate to get from the federal government to invest in ch children and their families at the earliest possible stage. That is how we will fundamentally change the trajectory of our city, particularly when it comes to violence. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of seeing the mayhem portrayed by the media every single day. I'm tired of having to make the calls to the families that are absolutely devastated because they've lost yet another loved one. I, it breaks my heart when I talk to young people growing up in neighborhoods who their whole life, what they experience is walking by murals, not full of beautiful art, but walking by murals full of the names of the people in their neighborhood who have been killed by gun violence. We can do better as a city, but importantly, folks, banding together, we must do better to reclaim our history. We must do better to reclaim our present. We've got to invest in ourselves and make sure that we create, that we create, not the mayor, not the superintendent, but we create a better future and destiny for our young people. Because what we're seeing played out every single day is the absence of hope. Young people not having any respect for themselves and certainly not valuing the sanctity of life of anybody else, the sanctity of someone's property, small businesses. We can change this around, but we've got to stop tearing each other down, tearing each other apart and coming together and having the courage to work on these problems. 
That's what this is about. So no, sir, it's not a stunt. This is a sincere, heartfelt effort on the part of all of us to create a better, safer, and more equitable Chicago. So thank you very much, and I really appreciate you all coming out. You could be doing a lot of other things on your Wednesday night, but you chose to be here. And what that says to me is that you love your city. So now I'm going to turn it back to Tina. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, everyone, who um, came out tonight and is still here. So. Southside did itself proud. More questions in West Side. <laughs> we will get to as many of them as, you can, as we can. And remember what I told you all at the beginning, we're going to start to combine them into groups. And so the first group we're going to talk about is funding for the police. Should we introduce everybody who's up Yes, we should. OK. My goodness gracious. <laughs> but before I do that. We are going to introduce the people who are sitting on the stage with the mayor. And I don't know if you want to introduce yourselves you could, yeah. so people can hear your voices. So how about that? <clears throat> Starting with Pedro. Good evening, everyone. Pedro Martinez, CEO of CPS. Very blessed to be here. I'm David Brown, the superintendent of police for the Chicago Police Department. Happy to be here. officer for community safety. Thank you. I'll take off my mask. I'm Allison Arwini, <laughs> Commissioner at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Thanks for being here. Good evening. I'm Brandi Kanazi, Commissioner for the Department of Family and Support Services. Happy to be here. We brought out like the A team. I'm also going to ask the commissioners and deputy mayors and chiefs in the audience to stand up and directors to stand up so people can see the folks who are here. They also might get called on on some of these questions. So um, I'm going to start with the first question. And this is a question we saw on the west side. So I don't know if I got a traveler. But um, I do want to start with the same question. Um, because I think it's important <coughs> that we um, confront this question, including talking about perhaps some of the myths. So how are you really addressing the root causes of crime when we spend more on the police then we spend on public health, violence prevention, homeless services, and mental health services combined. Uh, I'll, I'll start. You see, I, put, I put the slide up, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so actually, the numbers don't add up. Yes, we do spend a tremendous amount of resources on the police, but we also spend a tremendous amount of resources on all the other things that we know make a difference in getting at the root causes of violence. And I'll just be upfront about it. I do not support defunding the police. Um, and frankly, and frankly, let me just tell you why I, I don't. Number one, in the middle of a crisis that we're experiencing, um, decreasing the amount of funding for the police to me doesn't make any sense. And when I talk to people about this question of defunding, I asked, do you literally want to cut the budget of police? Now, some people do. But what I also hear from a lot of folks is what we want is our fair share of funding to support programs like mental health, uh, affordable housing, um, uh, making sure that we're supporting uh, families and, and other resources. And I agree with that. I think we've got to do both and, as you can see um, from this slide, we're doing just that. And let me be clear with you, when you talk about defunding the police, particularly in a city like Chicago, 95% of our budget is personnel. So if we literally started cutting the police, we would be cutting personnel. Not all the extraneous programs, because that's not what drives the police budget. And in doing that, following the collective bargaining uh, agreements, we'd be cutting the least senior people first. And who are they? They're the most diverse, best trained officers that we have. So we'd be cutting out diversity. 
And many of you talk to me about the fact, hey, we've got to have more police that look like us in neighborhoods on the south and the west side, and I agree. But if we defund, those are going to be some of the first people that go. So I think it's a both and proposition that we've got to continue to make sure that we make the investments that are necessary to support strong, healthy, vibrant communities. And that's the way, as I said uh, at the outset, that we get at the root causes of violence and we support the communities and families that are desperately in need of resources. Um, thank you, Mayor. There are two related questions, and we may not need to answer them in as much detail, but they're s slightly different enough that I want to read them. And this, uh, well, this is another one from you, Chabelle. Um, can you explain how policing is going to increase community safety um, when uh, CPD's budget keeps growing and crime rates are not falling? And then similarly, the Chicago Police Department budget is three times as much as all 2022 investments. Are you all taking an evidence-based approach to determine um, this funding discrepancy? And if so, what is the approach? Well, I, th I think I answered both of those questions in my first response. But I'm also going to invite uh, the superintendent um, to address the issue of really what are you, the, the, the heart of the question is, why should we keep spending money on the police? Mm -hmm. um, are they really being effective? Um, and the question you get all the time, what's the plan? Yeah, so what's the plan, what's the plan, what's the plan? I don't know that there is a plan. It's what we hear constantly, that we don't see the police reacting in ways that we want them to react. Now, I will just echo the mayor. Every community we go to, they want more police in this city. Every community. And we, we are obviously challenged with the current spike in gun violence. But I will just say this, the plan is a five-point plan plus one. The five-point plan includes not only reforming the police department, but engaging the community. It also includes officer wellness and improving investigations and improving public safety enforcement. And the plus one to our plan is recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce that reflects this community. That's the plan. And the plan is a multi-tiered plan. It has metrics that measure success and failure, and it has accountability in place. A, a very strong aspect of our plan is holding officers accountable for their conduct, number one. When, when they are not performing in the ways we all expect, we hold them accountable. But secondly, hold them accountable for their productivity, <coughs> for doing the things that this community expects it to do and taking guns off the street and violent offenders off the street. And we are doing that. But I will also say this, I'm born and raised in a black community, and I've been black a long time. <laughs> and when you have open air drug sales next door to your mom's and grandmom's house, you want the police to do something about it. When, when there's a shooting across the street from your aunt's and uncle's house, you want the police to do something about it. You want someone held accountable when your loved one is a victim of violence, whether that's gun violence or domestic violence, Regardless of what the violence is, you want the police to do something about it. So there's an immediate need for police to do something about the things that make us all unsafe. In addition, there's also a long-term plan that includes investment, that includes particularly our young people, so that they can make better decisions. You know, the same characterization of our young people who carjack someone should be the same characterization and, and the same font size and sense of urgency and time in media with the kid on the west side that had a perfect score on the ACT. The kid on the south side that just got a million dollars in scholarships. So all of our kids are not making bad decisions. Some are, and those are the kids we all should focus on. Policing is not a solution to the needs that our children have. Our community is and government can facilitate that help, but our community is that solution. And so the last thing I will say is that the police department needs the community to be successful. We need you, absolutely cannot do our jobs without the community. So we absolutely appreciate you being here and your time and your effort. Many of you have done great work in this community for a very long time. And I just want to be the first one to say thank you for the work you've done in this community, but more work to do. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you, Superintendent. Table one must have been a hot table because the first questions we got, we also got a comment from that table. We need more police and city resources to help combat shooting, traffic issues, carjacking, and vehicle hijacking. So um, I always read those questions because oftentimes in a room like this, there are people who want we challenge the funding for police, but there's also people saying, why don't I have more police? And so I want to be sure that that balance is reflected. This is a multi-part, really good question. Um, how and to whom are prevention services being directed? What kind of media blitz is being done to educate and promote the services that are available? And messages that create a realistic culture of change? Um, what resources that are free are for residents who are mentally ill and where do they get them? And what measures of success will be used for our programs? Um, okay, can that, we pay? That, that's, a mouth, that's a mouthful. I right know, but it was me. really good. So <laughs> I decided to go for it. Well, I, I think there's something for, for everybody. Yep. Well, what I'm going to do is ask Dr. Arwady um, to take uh, the piece of the question about mental health and trauma, because that seemed to be a consistent theme at a lot of the tables. Um, so, Allison, if you could talk to folks about, you know, what we've done, how we've kind of changed the focus of um, our support and resources around mental health, um, and what challenges you see right now that, frankly, folks in this room could help with. Go ahead. Um, so, mental health huge topic, huge need, lots and lots and lots of unmet need when we are talking about mental health in Chicago. And that need has only gotten worse over these last couple of years with COVID. I wanna just very quickly give a little bit of data because folks were asking about funding for mental health. And I do want you to hear to this point of increasing investment that in 2019, before the mayor was in, our mental health budget for the whole city was $12 million. Most of that was going into a relatively small number of clinics. We served about 3,500 people across the city. Since the mayor's come in, as of last year, we've seen a tripling of the mental health budget and actually with the additional funding that's come in from the federal government, the American Rescue Plan, we've got seven times the funding of what we had in 2019. I'm gonna be on, yeah, it's important, it's critical, it's still not enough, and we know how many people are still not accessing what we need. But we've gone from serving direct services, about 3,500 people, to last year about 27,000 people, and we're on track for 60,000 people this year. But more than that, we're trying to think beyond bricks and mortar clinics. They are important, and there's, uh, we've, we've set up something called the Trauma-Informed Centers of Care, where we're, we're committing to investing putting mental health services where people are already going, but more is needed. So in some cases, that's funding the child psychiatrist who can help add additional services in a clinical setting. In some cases, it's funding a social worker who can do counseling at the food pantry. But it's folks and organizations that are in communities doing work want and need additional funding to grow the mental health resources. And we're trying to take a no wrong door approach when it comes to mental health, bringing it out of the clinics because there are a whole lot of people with mental health, substance use disorder, often overlapping with uh, unstable housing who are not meeting, you know, who are not gonna keep a 10 a.m. appointment on a Thursday in a clinic. So getting those services out, embedding mental health professionals in our crisis response um, protocols, and really we've been working actually with CPD on things like diverting folks who are who are arrested with uh, possession of drugs instead of booking into the criminal justice system let's divert folks actually into treating that substance use disorder there's yeah this is the kind of stuff that is new here in Chicago and needed 
We've got a long way to go, but we're expanding. We've already expanded under this mayor, and I want and know that every single thing that we are funding here, our trauma-informed centers of care included, are open to every resident of Chicago, regardless of insurance status, regardless of income, sliding scale down to zero, regardless of immigration status, because I want these resources for everybody, and we all need to be talking more about mental health, dropping some of that stigma, having this be not just the absence of mental illness, but the way in which all of us can work on our mental health. So long way to go, but we're really excited at the health department to be on truly a right and I think new path uh, for addressing this huge unmet need in Chicago. And can you just talk briefly about the unspoken comment? Sure. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we're going to be launching this, this campaign called Unspoken, which is literally about how do we start talking about mental health. Some of you may know that we've done a lot around vaccine ambassador work. There are courses through city colleges, uh, really helping Chicagoans know how to talk to each other about getting a vaccine, for example. And thank you to all of you who have gotten vaccinated. But we'd like to recreate some of this so that more people in Chicago feel comfortable starting the conversation about mental health, turning it from something that too often is unspoken and recognizing that very often mental health issues that are with people throughout their lives emerge in the late teenage and early 20s, which is the time when often people are getting disconnected from school, they don't have the other chronic health issues yet that may bring them into medical care. There's a big gap there. So you're gonna hear more about unspoken, but it's about all of us being honest and talking about the fact that we all could work on our mental health even if we're not working on severe mental illness. And there are a lot of people with, with really serious mental illness that is not addressed sometimes for decades. So talking about it, turning this into something that is spoken, you're gonna see more about this and we'd love to have folks really be, be part of this um, as we roll out additional pieces. Thank you, Allison. One part of the question was about to whom are the prevention services being focused? And I'm going to ask Tamara Mahal to take on that part of the question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in terms of violence prevention services, when we think about the populations that are, are really being supported, um, the city has actually significantly increased funding to support street outreach, um, which are organizations that work with groups to mediate concerns, but also identify people who need wraparound support services, but also to increase funding for victim supports. Um, so for those who have been impacted by violence, working directly with them to ensure that they have support for legal assistance, that they have mental health care, that they have access to other services that they might need to, to recover in a really great way, um, the city has significantly increased those resources. So whereas in 2019, whereas there was only a couple million dollars, for example, going to street outreach and victim support services, now there's almost $25 million annually going, which is an increase of about tenfold. Um, and so it's really important that we're utilizing risk-based services to make sure that we're getting to those that are currently involved in violence and providing them with the wraparound services like mental health and substance use disorder treatment, but also addressing their housing needs and making sure that they have access to long-term unemployment. And the city does that in partnership with a large number of community organizations that are out there doing the work and quite frankly, workers that are putting their lives at risk every day to be able to go out and do that. Thank you. So there are several really spot on questions about youth. I'm going to read them off because what happens is you all start answering all of them and I want people to know that we ask their questions. So um, one question is, um, wait, I'm going to find one that is, what is seriously in place to address getting young offenders engaged in behavior that is positive? Suggestion, free community centers, sponsoring organizations that fight violence, but there's more. 
With all the youth violence, robberies, carjacking, murders, when will the Chicago Police Department start a police athletic league program that develops athletic talent? Doing that already. Uh, you going to be able? Um, are there conflict resolution programs at CPS and K-12? I think I'm hitting everybody here. Is the city willing to increase funding for youth after school and summer jobs to match uh, work wages and convince young people to turn away from the streets? Maybe we start at that end with Brandy and the jobs program. But let's let's actually start with um, mm -hmm. with Pedro and talk about some of the things that we're doing um, at CPS. And I don't know if you uh, um, can talk about Choose to Change and the Scan program. Or scan programs you, but talk about Choose to Change and then we'll we'll jump in. Thank you, Mayor. So, um, so first of all, everybody, we we have several programs. One is one of the ones that's the most exciting for me is the Choose Choose for Change program, where we're taking students that are at risk. Uh, one of the things we know is that when we start seeing significant absenteeism in our schools or students that drop out and uh, many of them join our alternative programs, immediately we see risk factors. And so we created a program with the community. It's community agencies in the south side and in the west side that work with these children that have a case manager, a counselor. Uh, we actually uh, get the students support for mental health for getting jobs and more importantly that we get them to finish school because one of the, that's one of the things that we see as success. We've seen a huge success rate. We're getting quite a bit of funding from the support with the mayor, support from phil uh, philanthropy. We're gonna continue to expand those programs. Uh, in addition, in our high schools, we, uh, we've been investing in counselors and in case managers and in staff that focus on restorative justice. So one of the things we wanna make sure in our high schools that we're modeling when a student makes a mistake that instead of overly punishing students, that we actually have uh, more uh, processes where, it's, where students can talk to each other, where we can, again, practice restorative justice, which is a much more positive way, and actually research has shown that it, that it really does reduce discipline behavior. So we're, we're aggressively investing in that as well across our high schools. So how many of you heard the story about the 11-year-old who was arrested for carjacking? Terrible story. Well, here's the, here's the, the chapter, um, the next chapter that you haven't heard about. That 11-year-old um, was growing up in a family that was really coming apart. Um, his mother died, his father's gravely ill, and he was real, literally out in the streets. He gets arrested, a prolific carjacker, I think. When the police went to his house, he had 20-something key fobs. Big sensational story. But here's what's happened. CEO uh, Martinez talked about the Choose for Change program. CPS got this kid who had been disconnected from school back into school. And he had huge pressure from relatives who were trying to get him to leave a stable home um, and get back into the street life. But amazingly, at 11 years old, he resisted. And I'm happy to tell you that even in this short period of time, from the time that he was arrested to the time that he got involved in intervention and programming provided by CPS, last week, this kid was on the honor roll at his school. So what that tells us is if we find these children who are right on the precipice and we provide them with the support and resources that we can truly change the trajectory of their lives. We've got to be diligent and we've got to get them at the right point, but we've got the support and resources at our fingertips to make a difference in these children's lives. I'm going to ask Brandy uh, Kanazi, the um, Commissioner of the Department of Family Support Services, to talk a little bit about the SCAN program. Thank you, Mayor. So the SCAN program is the Service Coordination and Navigation Program, and that was really built for young people who are at the highest risk of violence. They have to meet two criteria in order to come into the program. First one is be justice involved, and then the second set of criteria, either they're disconnected from school, they're disconnected from work, or they've showed violent signs of online behavior. And so the program is voluntary and we really work with young people to create a pathway, right? To create a care plan for them 
that is designed by them for them. The goal is really to stabilize them in their environment or if need be, take them to another environment. We've been able to work with our homeless division and provide um, housing services to young people. So that's really important. Some of our young people are homeless. The second thing is either we work to get them back in school or through our summer jobs program, we get them connected to employment services. The last piece about this is really working with a trusted and a caring adult, making sure that young people have someone who they can talk to, right? When you're on the verge of you don't know which way to go and your friends are trying to influence you, you've got to be able to have some someone who understands and can relate to your situation and help you make a different decision. And so holistically, we try to support young people through that program. And can you just talk, um, Brandy, for a little bit about um, the summer jobs program and the other opportunities for youth employment? So I'm gonna first start by saying that the summer jobs program, One Summer Chicago, applications are now open for young people age 14 to 24. We've got two, and let me give you the website before I forget, because I always do that. It is onesummerchicago.org. Applications are open now and they'll be open through the month of April. We've got several tracks that we have for summer jobs. The first one is Chicago Ability, which is for 14 and 15 year olds. And so this is really for young kids who they're too adult for perhaps, you know, summer camp, but they're not old enough to actually have a job. And so we pay them a summer stipend of $850 and really focus on career exploration, right? Getting young people engaged in like getting their appetite wet for what's possible in their career. Second, we have our traditional program, Summer Youth Employment Program, and that's for young people 16 to 24. The wages are $15 an hour. Someone had asked the question about, you know, is that compatible with minimum wage? And it is. We actually were able to, with Mayor Lightfoot's investment in the Chicago Recovery Plan, weighs the wages for our young people so they are competitive. Um, with this, uh, the Summer Jobs Cohort, it comes with a youth, not only a coordinator, but also a career counselor to make sure that we're having conversations and we're having meaningful experiences with the young people about what is their path forward after the summer ends. The third program, which is also new, and that's also through the Chicago Recovery Plan, that's a $29 million investment, is a year-round program, which is the Chicago Youth Service Corps. And that was really founded in 2020 based on young people being home um, and not being able to be in school and being online. A lot of young people said to us, like, I feel disconnected. I can't get out. I can't make a difference. And so it is a civic engagement program that allows young people to really design and solve problems in their own neighborhood and create their own solutions. And so at the end of the cohort, they present a capstone that's really about what's possible. And the, I think the great thing about the program is it gets people out, it gets them thinking, but also their solutions are so realistic that we help them implement their proposals. This year, for the first time, the program will be more than just, you know, summer or fall break program. We're gonna be able to do it year round and offer it for 40 weeks a year. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Gia Biagi, uh, the commissioner of the Department of Transportation. And I asked her to come up and talk about another youth initiative um, called the uh, Green Corps. Go ahead, Gia. Sure, thank you, Mayor. I thought I was in trouble getting the <laughs> finger to come up here. Um, so yes, uh, so Green Corps is a program that's operated by the Department of Transportation, and it's all about getting both kids and people who have barriers to employment paid to be trained in jobs around horticulture. So that's helping restore vacant lots, that's planting, that's gardening, that's really bringing our city back to life in terms of beautification, but doing work on in neighborhoods where folks live. And so it's a, a program, the adult part of the program, um, where actually applications are open now, so uh, we can provide that link, uh, where you can sign up and get trained, paid to be trained, and then it transitions to work and contracts uh, to work jobs going forward uh, in the long term. And so, and we have a uh, whole graduation, and there, it's at about a 90% uh, of our graduates uh, continue in long-term employment in those landscape fields uh, for the next five years or more. But under this mayor, we 
relaunched a, a youth Green Corps program. And so this is working with schools, uh, particularly in neighborhoods that are experiencing escalated levels of violence and working with kids in a training program where you learn the same kinds of skills, but you also learn how to be a bike mechanic. You also get a chance to see the kinds of opportunities you have in the trades, whether it's transportation or other kinds of work. And again, it's a paid training program for kids in high schools, and then we transition you into jobs after that. So uh, it's another example. You might not think of your Department of Transportation um, as being part of this, but I think what you're hearing here is this is a whole of government approach. We're all hands on deck and putting everything we know how to do in service of uh, violence prevention. Thank you. And we do have a police athletic league. It's actually a police athletic and arts league. Angel, if you mind, Chief Navalis runs that program. It includes baseball, basketball. We are launching a boxing uh, athletic league, uh, getting back involved in Golden Gloves. Uh, we're doing arts for our young people, but it's also a big opportunity for our police officers to build trust with these young people and to mentor them in making good decisions. Angel, just briefly highlight this, and uh, afterwards, please grab him if you're interested or have a young person that might be interested. Yeah. First of all, tell us who you are. Thank you very much. My name is Angel Valles, and I am the Chief of Constitutional Policing and Reform, uh, formerly the Deputy Chief of Community Policing. Uh, and fortunately, I was allowed to do both of them, uh, and I will be happy to, to work with all of you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor and uh, Superintendent Brown, for affording me this opportunity. So when we talk about the police and athletic leagues, one of the things that we knew from the beginning is that we needed to provide an intervention for youth. Uh, I was fortunate enough growing up uh, in Humble Park that I had that opportunity. And by the grace of God go I, because I could have been any of those youth that is out there who's engaged in delinquent behavior. But I was fortunate enough that 13 district police officers intervened and I was part of a sports league, a football sports league at Eckerd Park. So when the superintendent talked about engaging the youth, we knew that we had to make that intervention possible. So we we wanted to create opportunities where officers and the youth could come together, have that opportunity to build that relationship, afford the officers an opportunity to coach and mentor the youth, and also have the youth learn to trust our police officers. So the Police Athletic League, uh, we have two uh, charters currently right now. We are working to have five and be blanket citywide. Charter number one is on the west side, and we were fortunate enough to partner with Sergeant Jermaine Harris and the City of Refuge on the west side and the West Side uh, Sports League. Currently, they run sports all year round, from uh, baseball to basketball to flag football, and they started out with only two sites, and it has grown to 11 sites. And we've been fortunate enough that we have a lot of officers that volunteer as coaches, and I can tell you that the officers find it incredibly rewarding to have that opportunity and to get the insight that youth have that we may no longer have. Second, we have it out on the south side. Uh, with Stomp Out Gangs and Drugs, it's Marco Johnson's group. They're currently working out of Hamilton Park. Same concept, we have baseball, football, um, and uh, basketball. So if any of you want, want to get involved, if you want to be a coach, a mentor, or if you just want to trust us with the opportunity of engaging your children, please contact, contact us at the community policing offices. We will be more than happy to have citizen coaches and the youth to participate with us. I hope I answered your question, but if I did not, I will be floating around here as long as it takes to answer your questions. If you have any questions on it, please approach me. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. There will be a follow-up email after this event, and I'm going to make sure all these links are in that follow-up email, so um, be sure on that. Um, there are lots of questions about blight, about vacant lots that are not taken care of. There's one I want the person to know. I see the specific question about a specific lot, and we will follow up. Um, there are questions about lights, having more lights on the street, and questions about um, whether or not the city will be providing cameras to homeowners. Um, so uh, I know that these are things that like, are sort of clumped together, um, but I'm thinking that we might be able to respond to the blight issue, as I call it. 
Well, why, why don't I tee it up and then uh, I'm going to ask um, Tamara, Gia, and Cole, come on up, man. <clears throat> Cole Stollard is our uh, commissioner of streets and sanitation. Many of you know him. Great guy. Um, look, we hear about vacant lots and the challenges with them all, all the time. It's probably the number one uh, complaint that we get. The city of Chicago owns 10,000 vacant lots, just us alone. Then you've got the private homeowners, you've got the, the uh, Cook County Land Bank. Um, so what are we doing uh, to make sure that we address this challenge once and for all? We put a substantial amount of money as part of our $1.2 billion of investments specifically focused on vacant lots. Um, what we are doing is going back and tracing the origin of these lots because we want to turn them into productive community assets. But you've got to know, was there a previous industrial use that might need some uh, remedi environmental remediation? What is the history of it? Does, do we actually really own it uh, or is it something else? So we put a tremendous amount of effort and energy into tracing back the history of these lots with the idea that we're going to turn them into community assets. And again, whether it's uh, affordable housing, whether it's a commercial development, um, or a green space, whatever the community wants, that's what we want to do um, to support. And that's being led out of the mayor's office, um, but there's a number of other things that touch both CDOT and Streets and Sand um, regarding making sure that these blighted lots are taken care of. So why don't we start with Cole, and then we'll take you off the hot seat, and then we'll go to Gia. Thanks, Mayor. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Met some friends, Mayor, over there. Uh, right there, they're waving to us. <coughs> they're going to help us out starting tomorrow. Excellent. We're going to be meeting with them tomorrow at 1030 to uh, drop off some bags and some equipment for them to help clean the community, and we're going to work on picking the stuff up. So uh, I'd, I'd like to say thank you to my new friends over there at table number 18. Uh, but what we've done is we've worked with the mayor and the budget department to literally get more funding for reentry folks. So we were able to work with the unions and double our efforts uh, for this season. So that was a, about 10 years in the, in the makings of trying to get this worked out. But under mayor's leadership, we were able to do that. So we're literally doubling our efforts there. We continue to work with um, Chief Judge Evans and uh, Sheriff Dart in regards to bringing the SWAP program back. And as the mayor mentioned, uh, there's a one summer program that we're at Streets and Sand and I'm not going to speak for CDOT, but CDOT that we're clamoring for those young adults to come out and help us clean the boulevards, paint the, paint the viaducts, and it's a really great program that we uh, was successful over the summers, um, but with the pandemic we weren't able to do that. Uh, we've been working with the state. Hopefully we're seeing a little better uh, situation on these expressways uh, with as far as the litter. Um, just recently, we've cleaned from 83rd to 63rd on the south side on the, the um, roads on the, the uh, frontage roads on the side. We just finished today from Damon all the way out to Central on 290 on both sides. And people were literally out there clapping as, as we're cleaning and thanking us. So we understand as the Department of Streets and Sanitation the importance of keeping the city clean. We passed out a letter today to all the businesses that's going to go out tomorrow. Just please keep in front of your business clean, the back of your business clean. Uh, business clean. And uh, we got clean and green coming next month, so uh, we're, we're here for you. Uh, Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is this on? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so, so in terms of, of lighting and other kinds of infrastructure, um, we're doing a number of things. So one, you know, we've got about 300,000 light fixtures across the city, and we've been able to actually add these smart notes to about 280,000 of them that tell us when a light is out. Whether it's daytime, nighttime, it sends us the information, turns into a work order, we can be more efficient and get our crews out there. And that, that's a good thing, but it's not everything. We know that our lights get vandalized, and we do have some blocks that maybe could use a little more lighting. Those are the kinds of things that uh, we're at the ready, and really thanks 
to uh, more capital money, uh, thanks to the mayor's efforts to get city council to get us some infrastructure funds, uh, we've actually been able to add money to our lighting budget and make sure that we're lighting up uh, areas of the city that need it. And in every neighborhood's different. We've heard that, um, you know, we'll hear different issues from one part of the city to the next. And so we need to hear about it. And, uh, you know, I'd like to follow up uh, with whoever wrote that on the card because we want to know which blocks. And toward that end, we're also working with uh, the community safety group on looking at the data. So where, what blocks specifically of the city are we experiencing the most challenges with lighting and with violence? And those are their priority locations. So we want to hear from you where those locations are. If you're experiencing it, you can certainly always uh, put it into 311, uh, but know that we see that as absolutely a fundamental part of making our neighborhoods feel safe, be safe, uh, vibrant and bright. Um, so whether that's lighting, whether that's fixing the potholes, um, we're all in to get those pieces of infrastructure done. Thank you. So I will tell you, that it's written on here from 95th to 67th Street on the Dan Ryan and in front of the CTA stations. So that, that they, I'll give it to you. <laughs> okay. There was also the question about not just lights, but security cameras and the use of security cameras and doorbell cameras to help combat crime. So an issue near and dear to my heart. So Tamara, why don't we rolling out our program for uh, cameras at residential homes. <laughs> Soon. Um, so the answer to that is that at, at, we understand that first and foremost, when it comes to blight, the city has the primary responsibility on the streetscape for ensuring that it's maintained and supporting our homeowners um, in getting that done. And so through the CSEC, we're working with our infrastructure departments to do something where we're going out and proactively looking to see what we need to fix without waiting for a complaint from 311. But I will say, if you have an issue that you need addressed here, if you're here from the CSCC, will you just raise your hand? There you go, folks. Just go find one of them, and they will, they'll help you out tonight. We, we also know, though, that we have to get resources to homeowners, business owners, um, and I would also say delivery drivers to make sure that they feel safe in their homes and that they have the resources that they need. So yes, we will be bringing new opportunities for homeowners across Chicago to get access to doorbell cameras, to get access to security lighting, to get access to vehicular uh, tracking devices. But we're also gonna be doing an extensive amount of work through your block club to be able to support those resources too. <laughs> So is that my next question? Um, yes, it is. Um, so whether you call it a block club or you call it a civic or you're a neighborhood association, whatever that looks like, you're working together to make your block a better place and the city wants to be able to support that. That is so important, especially when it comes to violence prevention. So we are gonna be coming to your community, holding community level events for block club members and block club leaders we are going to be working to directly provide resources, yes, for homeowners, but also to help clean up your block, bring more vegetation, bring more green space. Um, in whatever way that a block club really feels like it's, it needs assistance, um, that's what we mean when we say we're here to serve community and really work at the block level. We're really excited to be able to get to that work here starting, yes, very soon. Um, and, uh I'm, I, Tamara knows that I'm not a very patient person, and we've been talking about this camera program for longer than I care uh, to talk about, but it's coming because I've heard from you that you want home security, you want cameras, you want to be able to know who's coming on your doorstep or something's going on on your block, that you want to be able to have a camera to record it. So stay tuned, it is coming. All of us who work for the mayor understand her sense of urgency. Uh, there's just a comment, so I wanted to flag it. Uh, Patrick wants more homeowner associations and block clubs right up in there. We agree, we agree. I'm gonna turn to a couple of uh, a little bit more serious, uh, everything serious, but um, this is actually a question that is in police reform, it falls under that category. Why is it so hard to fire cops that break the law? 
You want to take that? I'll, uh-huh. I'll start, Mayor. You can jump right in. Right. So there's a multi-tiered <laughs> accountability process in Chicago. There's several different uh, levels of approval recommendation for disciplinary action on a cop. So one aspect of this is COPA and my office, the superintendent's office. COPA investigates serious allegations against cops. They have a finding of that investigation and then they recommend discipline. For example, say they recommend separation or termination from employment. That investigation and recommendation then comes to my office. I then either agree with COPA and its findings or I disagree. If I agree, this case then goes to the police board for final action. If I disagree, it goes to the police board for breaking the tie. So COPA may have recommended one thing, I may have recommended something different. Then that goes to the police board for the final decision on the recommendation. So if COPA and I agree on termination of the officer, it goes to the police board, more than likely the officer is terminated. But that process, if you can imagine, takes time to happen. It's not instantaneous. Because Chicago wanted a little bit of a separation of authority to discipline an officer, gave some of that authority to COPA to recommend, gave some of that authority to me to recommend, but it gave the final authority to the police board to either agree with COPA and myself to fire an officer or to break the differences COPA and I might have on whether or not an officer should be fired or not. So that's the process in Chicago. It's, 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 it, it's important for the due process uh, for how we uh, end up terminating an officer. That officer is going to have some representation some legal representation. And so we don't wanna jump and skip around and not follow due process and then things are undone, not because of what happened, but because we didn't follow the legal processes that uh, employment law requires. So that's the long version. We do hold office accountables in house. So one of the things that I do immediately is relieve an officer of their police powers. That's separate and apart from the process I just described. So say something happens that an officer does that we all are just shocks our conscience, but we got to follow this process to get to a final conclusion. Immediately, I can relieve that officer of their police powers. And that means that officer is off the street, not in public, not having the authority with the police, the, the gun and the badge to take any further police action until his case or her case winds through this process to the police board for final decision. Hope that helps. Um, I know that we're over time and we need to wrap up. I don't, we can't answer these questions, but Mayor, I think it's important to flag a few of these. Um, One is it says that there's a lot of focus on gun violence, but we need to have some focus on victims of sexual um, uh, violence, um, mm-hmm. particularly in the transgender community. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a question about, uh, there are several questions about a victim of violence memorial. Uh, what's the status of that? And um, Good Kids Mad City is in the house and they want to know about the Peace Book. Um, there are many, many other questions. Um, we are collecting them all and they will all be consorted with um, the questions that we're receiving from our other communities and in our report there will be answers to these questions. I will also look through carefully there are some of these questions that are like individual case questions like the vacant lot I mentioned um, and we will pull those out as well for follow-up. Um, and with that mayor I was going to turn it over to you for closing words. Well <clears throat> I'm here to um I'm here to just say thank you. Um, Thank you for caring about your community, your neighborhood, and your city. Uh, Thanks for spending uh, your uh, Wednesday evening with us. We learn a lot from being in community, and we can't do anything effectively without understanding 
what your lived experience is um, every day, and that especially includes making sure that we understand what's going on on a block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood basis around community safety and the challenges that we face. So as Tina said, um, we, this is the second of multiple uh, community town halls that we're gonna be having in the next couple of weeks. We will compile what we've heard, what we've seen, your questions and answers uh, into a report that we will make sure that's available to everyone who comes to one of these town halls. But again, I want you to know, and I hope you heard, the urgency with which we take community safety. The daily focus and attention making this the priority. And members of my cabinet know that every single thing that we do in every single, single city department has to and must be viewed for, through an eye and a lens towards community safety. So thank you very much for spending this time with us. Keep fighting the fight because we need you. We will take back our city block by block, but we can only do it if we work together. So thank you all very much.